Amen. Good evening. Happy Thursday. Are you glad to be here? That was terribly unconvincing. Are you glad to be here? I'll bet you're not half as glad as I am. You are? You think so? Wow, the GYC is growing, amen? But we need to be careful because even cancers grow fast. We want to grow not just in our numbers, we want to grow spiritually. Amen? So it's not just a large gathering, we want this to be a spiritual gathering. Amen? We don't want to, you know, my dad used to say to me, he used to say, boy, don't get too big for your britches. And we don't want to get too big for our britches, do we? We want to have a powerful, dynamic, intimate, real relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you say amen to that? And so, hey, don't get me wrong, I'm glad that there are whatever, 2,000, whatever it is, 3,000, I can't count very well, and I'm an evangelist, so to me it looks like 20,000. I'm glad that there's lots of people here, but I want to pray for myself that I won't just get caught up in all of the social component. I want to have a real, dynamic relationship with Jesus so that it's not just in terms of its quantity that the GYC is great, but in terms of its quality. Amen? Amen? So you know how we're going to do that? We're going to do that by being intentional about it and by being intentional about making our personal commitment. Our what did I say, everyone? Our personal commitment to Jesus, the most important thing at the GYC. No one here is happier to be around their friends and around their workers and around their colleagues than me. I'm a very social person. I love to be around people. And so that element, that component definitely ministers to me. But I want that to be secondary to the experience that I'm having with Jesus. Hallelujah. And so the GYC is growing numerically, and that's great. We praise the Lord Jesus for that. But let's continue to pray that it grows spiritually. That is infinitely more, better a hundred people in attendance that are fully converted and fully love the Lord Jesus Christ and are fully willing to lay it all on the line than 10,000 who are nominally attending. Like one group over here said amen. I was looking right at this whole group. Not, not one of you said amen. Amen? amen. amen. And you guys are on my right hand, so you're supposed to be the sheep. The goats are all saying amen. I'm looking forward to God ministering to us tonight through His Word. Amen? amen. I hope you didn't come to hear a preacher. I hope you came to hear a message preached. It's all about the message, beloved. Never forget it. It's the message. I was thrilled to hear the testimonies from campus and from Acts. Amen? I, I love a good testimony. To me, it's very exciting that young people are taking the torch and doing something real for the Lord Jesus Christ. Young people are not satisfied with mediocrity and inauthenticity. Young people want something that is real, something that is substantive. Can you say amen to that? So when I see groups like Acts and Campus getting up here and testifying for the Lord Jesus Christ, it thrills my soul. I had a young man just say to me uh, backstage, I won't mention his name, but he said to me straight out, he said, sometimes preachers wonder if they're making an impact. Sometimes preachers wonder if they're making a difference. He said, I want you to know that when you preached at Ann Arbor, when you made that appeal for missions and that sermon entitled, Stir What You Got, he said, that was a pivotal moment in my life. And then he said, you preached in Sacramento, carry the light, and you made that appeal for missions, and he said, that was a pivotal moment in my life. These were two of the most pivotal, crucial, critical moments in my life. And beloved, it's not because of the man and his elocution, it's because of the message. Can someone say amen? amen. Hallelujah. I've said this before and it bears repeating. If the preacher fell off of the stage and broke his neck, and by the way, that could easily happen. Have you seen how high this stage is? 
If the preacher fell off of the stage and broke his neck, there are hundreds of other people in this very room that could stand up and preach the same message with just as much power. Amen? Amen? No question. That's like a cliff. <laughs> Several years ago, I was preaching an evangelistic meeting in uh, Atlanta, and I was trying to make an illustration, and, and as part of the illustration, I jumped off of the stage, and I went out into the midst of the audience, and I was using the whole illustration for Daniel chapter 7. The little horn comes up among them, and I was saying, I'm not among you now, but I go out there, and now I'm among you. And, and uh, ever since that time, I mean, every single time 3ABN records me now, they say, please don't jump off the stage. <laughs> and so... I, I literally just had one of the guys just like not even two minutes ago say to me, please don't jump off the stage tonight. And I thought to myself, Lord have mercy, have you seen the stage? <laughs> You'd have to base jump off of this thing. All right, our message is entitled, What Do You Expect? And I believe God is going to be with us tonight, amen? amen? I believe that in the very core of my being. And I hope you brought your Bibles tonight because we will be studying the Bible, Amen? It will be a Bible message. And so let's pray as we get ready to start. And Lord Jesus, let's ask Him to be with us, to minister to us, to challenge us, to inspire us, and to convert us. If it's not too much trouble, I would just ask you to kneel. I know it's concrete, but I just kneeled back there and I can still stand. So why don't you kneel? Let's kneel together. Enough of this bowing your head. How hard is that? Let's kneel. We've got a lot to invest in this prayer. Father God in heaven, we come to you tonight on bended knee. Not, Father, because this posture makes us more holy, for you are infinitely holy and we are dust, we are nothing. Father, we kneel as a symbol that we believe you are the infinite, illimitable God of the universe. We kneel as a symbol of the fact that we can do nothing in our own righteousness. We need your righteousness. We need your power. We need your strength and your message. And Father, we kneel because we're sinners. Sinners in need of a Savior. Sinners transformed into saints and saved by the grace of Jesus. And Father, we kneel tonight because we are beggars in need of bread. We are beggars that are looking tonight and amidst the cacophony of materialism and secularism in this world today, we, we need a message from the Lord. We need a message from the living God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So, oh God, tonight as, as we open your word, as we humbly open your word, we want to ask that you would open our hearts. Minister to us tonight. Not because of who we are, but because of who you are. Give us a message from the throne of grace tonight. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Let all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. See, it didn't hurt you to kneel one bit, did it? What do you expect? This is a common and colloquial saying in this day and age. What do you expect, we say? We say this to get ourselves off the hook when we know that we have overpromised and underdelivered. We usually say this, oh, what do you expect, when we are invoking some kind of insuperable obstacle as to why we couldn't deliver the goods. We say, well, what do you expect? I'm just human. What do you expect? I'm just a teenager. What do you expect? I'm not an accountant. What do you expect? I'm not Superman. These phrases roll off our tongue with superlative ease. Now, what do you expect of me? We live in a culture in which we are accustomed to receiving less than was promised. 
We live in a culture in which we underdeliver because we are used to people undelivering to us, underdelivering. So we say, what do you expect? Because we've heard that so many times ourselves. What do you expect? We live in a day and age in which politicians promise change widespread reform and deliver nothing but the status quo. We live in a day and age in which publishers clearing house and other sort of these lottery mechanisms will promise ten million dollars and deliver only junk mail. We live in a day and age in which Madison Avenue will promise health and prosperity and popularity and deliver little more than credit card debt. We are accustomed to people telling us one thing and delivering another. That is our expectation. We have the expectation that if somebody tells us A, it's really going to be B. We know that the fine print does us in. We've heard it so many times. This is what we're going to deliver, whether it's from a politician or from a, a religious leader or a church leader or even a governmental leader. They say one thing, they deliver another. The billboards say this and deliver something very different. And we could go to them and say, hey, you said this. And we can just hear them saying it, can't we? Hey, what do you expect? I'm just one man. Yeah, but you promised this. Well, what do you expect? We're an advertising agency. That's what we're supposed to do. Yeah, but you said it wasn't going to be like this. You said it was going to be thus and so. But what do you expect? I'm not Superman. We are so accustomed to being over-promised and under-delivered that we have taken this mentality and we have utterly inculcated it into our way of thinking so that it is inexorably a part of who we are. We know that when people promise the goods, most of the time they don't deliver. Even our friends sometimes fail. They promise confidentiality and deliver gossip. Someone say amen. amen. We expect to be let down. We expect to get less than we paid for. We expect very little. And here's the danger. We bring this mindset. We bring this way of thinking from popular secular culture and we bring it to the God of the Bible. You're saying, no, no, not me. Yes, you. We are so accustomed to getting less than was promised we're so accustomed to not getting the promised delivered goods that when we come to the Word of God, we do not expect God to work in our day, in our time, just like He has in the past. I think that if you were absolutely, totally, brutally honest with yourself, you would admit that you don't really expect God to do something great today. I want to say that again. I think that if you were w willing to be brutally honest and transparent with yourself, you know in your heart of hearts, many of you, of course not all of you, I don't want to stereotype you or put you into a pigeonhole, but many of us, perhaps the vast majority of us, and perhaps even all of us, we don't really expect God to deliver like He says He will in His Word. Admit it. We know that God has worked mightily in the past, and we believe intellectually that God will work mightily in the future, but very few of us believe that God is going to work like that today. That's right. Someone say amen. Much of our belief in the Bible is little more than intellectualism. We do not serve the living God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob most of the time. Most of the time, our devotions are little more than a casual, brust, br uh, casual brush with a dusty old God in a dusty old book who did mighty things in the past. And yet, God is alive today. 
We bring this lowered sense of expectations to the Bible. Everybody else has under-delivered and we expect God to do the same. God has worked in the past, yes. God has, will work in the future, yes. But what about today? Have you ever noticed that life is made up of today? I got lost in a mall one time. Actually, in my hometown. We have this mall called Great Lakes Crossing. And it's the most confusing thing in the world. But I figured out it's just a great big circle. It took me a while. I'm not very good with maps. My wife is much better with maps. My wife is one of those people who can go to a city, not be there for five years, and go back to that same city and know her way around. My wife can go to a city she's never even been to and find something. I, 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 not me. I, I can barely find my house. I drive past my house all the time. In fact, just recently I drove past the airport like 40 miles, talking on the phone. I said, uh, you know, this doesn't look familiar to me. And I looked at the exit 40 miles ago, I passed my, I'm not good with this. Anyway, I was in this mall and, and they have these, uh, you know, the diagrams of the mall. And there's always the little red dot and the little arrow that says, you are here. <laughs> I've been here all my life. Have you ever thought of that one before? You're always here. Of course you're here. You've never not been here. And, and time is like that. All that you have is right here, right now, today. And that sounds like something you'd print on a t-shirt or something you'd, you know, knit and hang in your bathroom. All you have is today. But the reality is, is that it's true. And yet for many of us, our God exists at all times and in all places except right here, right now, today. Our God did something great in the past, let me tell you about it. Oh, and our God is going to do something mighty in the future, let me tell you about it. But you don't live in the past and the future is inaccessible to you. And so we live in a time and in a place when for most of us, we do not believe that God is going to act. We're very comfortable with Gideon's God. Open your Bible with me to the book of Judges, if you would. You'll find that in the Old Testament. Just after the book of Joshua, see if you can beat me there. Judges, chapter 6. Say amen when you get there. I'm there. Judges, what chapter, everyone? Chapter 6. What do you expect? Judges, chapter 6, beginning in verse 11. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abiezrite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. I'm in verse 12 of Judges 6. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. Verse 13. And Gideon said to him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened to us? And notice this, this is amazing. And where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Has anyone here ever had an angel appear to them and start talking to them? One of you? Maybe two or three? Did you argue with him? Yeah, I wouldn't either. But Gideon did. The angel of the Lord appears to Gideon and he says, God is with you, you mighty man of valor. You are going to utterly smite the Midianites and the Amalekites into non-existence. And what is Gideon's response? Hey, if that's true, Mr. Angel, then why has all this bad stuff happened to us? I mean, really, how come we don't get to see all of the good stuff that our fathers did? I mean, come on, where are all the miracles and, and the great and mighty acts of Jehovah God? Even Gideon in his day was already beginning to believe that God was a God who primarily had acted in the past. Who had primarily acted in what, everyone? And many of us are very comfortable with Gideon's God. We would say the very same thing if an angel appeared to us. We'd say, oh, sure that's going to happen. How come our forefathers got to see all these great things and our foremothers got to see all these great things? But what about today? 
Our God is safely quarantined and isolated in the annals of time, kept away from us by history. He has worked in the past. He has done something great in times gone by, but not today. Our God is like Gideon's God. Many of us also are very comfortable with the God of the woman that sat at Jacob's well. See if you can beat me to John chapter 4. Say amen when you get there. It's a race. I'm there. John chapter 4. John chapter 4. Are we all there? Amen? Verse 19. Jesus is sitting at Jacob's well. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worship Jesus on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where we ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship, you do not know what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the who, everyone? Of the Jews, verse 23. But the hour is coming, and now is, look at those three words, and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him. Let's all say it together. In spirit and in truth. Now watch what the woman says in verse 25. Here's the woman. Jesus has just said all these marvelous words. Here's the woman's response in verse 25. The woman said to Him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called the Christ. And when He comes, whoo-wee, let me tell you, He's going to tell us everything. Gideon's God was a God of the past. A God who had wrought and worked mightily in days gone by. Here Jesus, the great I Am of the Old Testament, is sitting with this woman right at the well and He begins to talk to her in the present tense. And when He finishes talking, she says, Oh yeah, 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 I know all that. When the Messiah comes, He's going to straighten this all out and He will do some mighty things and He'll tell us all things. This woman's God was a God of future action. She was totally unprepared for what Jesus said in the very next verse. One of the fullest disclosures of his messianic identity. Look at it in verse 26. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am. Now, if you look in your Bible there, it says he. But you will notice with me that the he is italicized, which means that the he was supplied, which means what Jesus was saying is, I am. You will note with me that God, when He appeared there to Moses on the plain of Midian, and, and He said to Moses, go tell that rascal Pharaoh to let my people go, and He protested and said, well, who shall I say sent me? You will remember with me that He didn't say, tell him the great I was sent you. You tell them I was that I was. Neither did he say, tell them the great I will be hath sent you. I will be that I will be. What did he say, everyone? Say it with me. I am. That's the present tense. It means right here, right now, I am the eternally existent one who exists not just in the past, not just in the future, but today. And the woman says, oh yeah, we know that when Messiah comes, he'll do great and mighty things. And then Jesus effectively says to her, I am. Gideon's God was a God of the past. The woman at the well's Messiah was the Messiah of the future. And most of us are happy with that kind of a God. A God who is safely quarantined away in the annals of history. And a God who is safely quarantined away in the, the inaccessible future. And all we have to live in is right here, right now, today. And for most of us, we do not expect God to work today. Admit it. Stop pretending and admit it. He said, oh, he's putting me into a box. He's trying to make me feel guilty. He's trying to make me feel bad. Beloved, do you know how I know that that is true? Because Jesus hasn't come back yet. If I read my Bible right, and I think I do, the one thing, the one obstacle that is preventing Jesus from returning and wrapping up this whole great controversy mess is the church. Someone say amen. amen. And do you know who the church is? I got news for you. It's not the General Conference. That's not to say that the General Conference isn't part of the church, but you know who the church is? It's me. And it's you. 
And so if the church is the problem, guess who's the problem? I'm the problem. See, you all said we are, but we are is too easy. Right? Someone say amen. We are is way too easy. Listen, I love to surf. There's not much surfing in Michigan as you can imagine. But I love to surf. And, and when I go surfing, it's usually in Florida because the water's warm there and I don't have a lot of body fat. So when I go to California, I get too cold too quick. So I do a lot of surfing in Florida and the place that I normally surf is usually flat as Lake Michigan, but every now and then it gets a wave and it's called New Smyrna Beach, the shark attack capital of the world. Now most people don't die when they get bit by these little, you know, three to six foot bull sharks and, and uh, black tip sharks. They just tear your calf off. So you get to live, but you're, you know, permanently maimed. And uh, I, have swam, I have swam many times with sharks. seen them go right by, whoop, whoop, whoop. And the only thing that keeps me in the water is I look around and I see about 200 other surfers. And I think to myself, chances are it won't be me. <laughs> but it's so funny. I'll go to that same beach. I'll go to that same surfing location. And if it's just me or maybe two or three other guys, I won't go in. Even though it's the same water, same location, same sharks. Because I know the chances that it's me have just gone up exponentially. See, it's very easy for us to say, oh, the problem is us. But let's practice saying, I'm the problem. I know that's going to be hard for us, but just try it. Say, I'm, okay, it's phonetic, I'm, the, now this is going to be hard for you, try to spit it out. Problem. Now let's say it in all one sentence, I'm the problem. Come on. Do you believe that? You are the problem. Stop trying to blame it on the church. Stop trying to blame it on your pastor. Stop trying to blame it on the Pope. Amen. You're the problem. Your problem is your God is not alive today. The God that exists in your mind is like Gideon's God who has worked in the past, who's done great things. Oh, you should have been there when he parted that Red Sea. That was awesome. Let me tell you about it. That's your God. And your God is just like my God, the woman at the well, the God who is going to do great things. I mean, let me tell you, we know that God is going to work mightily in the future. Just wait until the latter rain is poured out. You just wait. That's going to be awesome. And you just wait till there's a Sunday law. That is when this thing is going to... Yeah, that's going to be awesome. And just wait till the church gets doctrinally unified. Whoo! We have a whole list of things that once those things happen, then something great is going to happen at some nondescript time in the future. That is going to be good. Our God is just like the God of the woman at the well. Something great is going to happen at some time in the future, but just not right here, right now. And you know it's true. That's not to say that you don't think that God might do something. I've used this illustration before, but it bears repeating. I lose my keys in my wallet all the time. And uh, so I have to pray a lot that God will help me to find my keys. And I think God got tired of answering that prayer, and so He gave me a wife. I'm not kidding. She knows where my stuff is. Even if I'm in another country, I can call her. I can say, sweetheart, where's my wallet? She'll say, have you checked in your khaki pants? And there it is. <laughs> uh, she, she's a, but, but, but the point is this. You know, we lose our keys. We lose our wallet. And, and we pray. We say, oh, God in heaven, you're the living God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You're the mighty God that parted the Red Sea. You're the mighty God that enabled Peter to walk on the water. Now, could you please help me find my keys? <laughs> And we stand up and, oh, we have a eureka moment and we realize we left them in the ignition of the car and we go out there and there they are in the, the ignition of the car and we say, hallelujah, the Lord God lives. <laughs> and beloved, there's, uh, listen, God knows how many hairs are on your head. God knows when a sparrow falls to the ground. And so there's nothing wrong with God answering the little prayers. But our point is that we're satisfied with that. I mean, the God that did great things, the God that did awesome things, the God that did huge things, oh yeah, that's the God of the past. And the God that is going to work mightily, the God who is going to do great, amazing, mighty works, that God exists in the future. 
But for the vast majority of us, our God does not exist in the only place that we do. Namely, right here. Right now. And there is no story in the Bible that I know of that better illustrates this than John chapter 11. See if you can beat me there. Okay, well that was a little unfair. John chapter 11. Here we go. You ready? You know this story. Now, I know there's at least 10 people. I know there is at least 10 people here that just closed their Bible because you all know the story of John chapter 11. This is the story of what? The raising of Lazarus. And some of you say, oh yeah, I've been here, done that. Now, I've even preached on this. And so some of you seminarians, you just closed your Bible. Open your Bible back up and go to John chapter 11. Because sometimes we can find something new even in the old familiar text. Someone say amen. John chapter 11 beginning in verse 1. Now a certain man was sick. What was his name, everyone? Lazarus of Bethany in the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sisters went to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed how many more days? Two more days in the place that he was. This helps us to set the context. Very simple. One of Jesus' friends, Lazarus, gets sick. The message is sent to Jesus. He whom you love is sick. They didn't even give a request for him to come. Mary and Martha were so confident that Jesus would know exactly what to do. They didn't even ask him to come. All they said is, he whom you love is sick. They knew that that would elicit the immediate response of Jesus to come. Yet the Bible says that he waited for how many days, everyone? Two more days. Now let's continue to set the context here. I'm in verse 11. These things he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus, let's say it all together, everyone, sleeps. But I go that I may wake him up. Then his disciples said, Oh Lord, let us teach you something about health reform. When you're sick, it's good to stay resting. And here the disciples are teaching the great physician something about health. Oh Jesus, maybe you're, oh, maybe you're confused, Jesus, the great life giver. If he's sick, it's better just to let him be. They were totally confused. Look at verse 13. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he spoke of his taking a rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, let's say it all together, Lazarus is dead. This helps us to set the context. Jesus is waiting. His friend is sick and he knows it. And so he waits for two days. And then he says, okay, it's time to go wake up Lazarus. The disciples protest. And he said, listen, let me tell you something plainly. Lazarus is dead. So eventually Jesus makes his way to Bethany. Let's pick the story up. Jesus on his way to Bethany, we pick the story up in verse 17. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb for how many days, everyone? Four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away, and many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went out to meet him, but Mary was sitting in the house. Mary was just so devastated that Jesus hadn't come, she couldn't even face him. She stayed in the house. Notice this now. It says in verse 21, Now Martha said to Jesus, not hi, not hello, not how are things. The very first words out of her mouth are, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. The very first thing that she says is, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. Let me ask you a question. Is that a statement of faith or a statement of doubt? It's both. Because it's a statement of faith because she's saying, if you would have been here, you could have prevented it. But it's also a statement of doubt because she's saying, why weren't you here? Now, I want you to notice something that Martha doesn't say, I believe, it's possible, it could be, perhaps. She says, I know that if you would have been here, he would not have died. I have a question for you. In Martha's mind, was Jesus able to do something powerful four days ago? Yes or no? Oh, sure. Was Lazarus sick, everyone? Yeah, and basically what Martha said is, oh, Jesus, if you would have been here four days ago, you could have done something. I know that if you would have been here four days ago, you could have prevented him from dying. Did Martha have total confidence that Jesus could have worked in the past, yes or no? Absolutely. Oh, if you would have been here, you really could have prevented this. Now look at this. Verse 23. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Notice the first two words out of, out of her mouth. Verse 24. Martha said to him, what are the first two words? I know. 
Jesus says to her, Martha, I got great news for you. Your brother's going to rise again. And Jesus is thinking in like 20 minutes. I just got to take care of a few, you know, niceties here. I'll make my way over to the tomb. Your brothers, you will have dinner with your brother tonight. But I want you to notice what she says. Look at this. I know, I want everyone, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection, what? At the last day. Oh, does Martha believe that Jesus could raise Lazarus in the future? Absolutely. So let's step into Martha's world now. Martha believed that Jesus could have done something in the past. Martha believed that Jesus will do something in the future. But Jesus had said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. I'm in verse 25. I am. Let's say that together. I am. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, yet he shall live. And whoever believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Martha believed that Jesus could have prevented Lazarus from dying. And Martha believed that that same Jesus was going to raise Lazarus at the last day. But when Jesus says to her, Your brother will rise again, it doesn't even cross the radar screen of her mind that Jesus meant right now. Oh, but some of you are sneaky Bible students. And you read verse 22, didn't you? Yeah, you did. You thought Pastor Asher didn't do his homework. Look at verse 22. She says, but I know that even now, whatever you ask of God, He will give it to you. And you're looking at verse 22 and verse 27. You're saying, oh, Pastor Asher, she believed that he could do it right there. No, she didn't. She did not believe that he could do it right there. Do you know how I know for fact that she did not believe that? Because when Jesus makes his way to the tomb in just a few moments, and he says, take that stone away from the tomb, Martha raises an objection. She says, no, 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 he's been in the tomb for four days, he's going to stink. She had an intellectual belief. Oh, sure, it's possible, Jesus. It's intellectually possible that you could do something, but in the unlikely event that you will, we know you'll do it in the future, and we know you could have done it in the past. Martha's belief is just like your belief. How many of you believe that God could work mightily today? Go ahead and raise your hands. Raise your hands right now. You believe that. Yeah, I know you believe that, but your belief is just like Martha's. It's totally intellectual. Because when it comes time for the rubber to meet the road, you're going to object just like Martha did. Incidentally, Mary said the same thing. I'm still in John chapter 11. And notice with, with me, Mary says the very same thing in verse 32. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet and she said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have what, everyone? Die. She says the same thing. You know that the ladies had been talking. Sometimes that happens, huh, ladies? All the ladies say Amen. All the pious ones won't say amen, but the Lord reads your heart. Now, don't get me wrong. Guys can gossip too. Amen. But clearly the ladies had been talking. Because the first thing that comes out of Martha's mouth, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. First thing out of Mary's mouth, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. You could have done something in the past, Jesus. It's just too bad the past is gone. Jesus says your brother will rise again. Oh, I know. Oh, I, I'm total confident. Jesus, I went to the seminary. I know that he's going to raise again in the resurrection at the last day. So they make their way over to the tomb. I'm picking it up in verse... Let's pick it up in verse 33. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in his spirit and he was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said, Lord, come and see, verse 35, Jesus what, everyone? Now, is Jesus weeping for Lazarus? Is Jesus weeping for Lazarus? Yeah. You know why we know that Jesus is not weeping for Lazarus? Because he knows he's going to raise him in just a few minutes. Isn't that right, young lady? Yeah, even she knows. No question about it. It says, Jesus wept, shortest verse in all the Bible. Then the Jews said to him, oh, see how he loved him. Oh, he's so devastated. Verse 37. And some of them said, could not this man, look at this. Everybody believed like Mary and Martha. Could not this man uh, who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Notice, couldn't he have kept him from dying? 
But why not say, could not this man who healed the eyes of the blind, couldn't he raise him from the dead? That thought doesn't even come across anyone's mind. This is fascinating, by the way. Incidentally, do you know why Jesus is crying? One word. I can tell you why Jesus is crying in one word. Unbelief. Let's all say that together. Unbelief. That's why he's crying. In the Desire of Ages, Ellen White makes this abundantly clear. She says that he looked all around them. There's people, oh, we miss Lazarus so much. And Jesus, the great I Am, the Messiah, the one for whom the Jews had looked for more than a thousand years, is standing in their very midst. And there's a dead body over there. There's the life giver. There's the dead body. Everyone's wailing. And Jesus says, you missed it. Here I am. I'm here. I can do it. I can raise him. And nobody even sees it. Not even Mary sees it. Martha doesn't see it. The disciples don't see it. They're all wailing and bemoaning the death of Lazarus. No one sees it. And so Jesus begins to cry and they don't even discern why he's crying. But he's crying for them, not for Lazarus. I'm going to say something here. Don't you ever forget this. Your unbelief breaks the heart of God and causes him to weep. Say amen. Your unbelief causes God to weep. Incidentally, you know that that's why they were crying. Jump down to verse 42. Jesus is praying here to his Father and he says in verse 42, the last part of verse 41, Father, I thank you that you have heard me and I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they might what? Believe that you sent me. Jesus is weeping for their unbelief. The great life giver, the great I am, is standing in their very midst. And they're missing it. He's not the great I was at that moment. He's not the great I will be. He's right there. The I am mighty to save and no one gets it. So Jesus says, verse 38, Jesus, groaning within himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the what, everyone? Stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said... Lord, by this... Notice what she didn't say. She didn't say, oh, praise God. Jesus, you're going to raise him right now. I don't know why I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that earlier. Marvelous, wonderful, glory. Jesus is going to raise Lazarus. Everyone, listen, stop crying. Notice what she says. Lord, he stinks. <laughs> Has it even crossed the radar screen of Martha's mind that Jesus could raise Lazarus right there, yes or no? Yes or no? It's not even on the radar screen. It's not even in the universe of her mind. She raises an objection. Oh, Lord, I don't think that's such a good idea. Isn't it funny? The disciples wanted to teach something about health, and now Mary wants, Martha wants to teach something uh, to Jesus about death. Jesus, let us teach you something about decomposition. He's going to stink. And many of us are busy teaching God something instead of being taught by God. Mm. Another sermon. Won't preach that one right now. Desire of Ages, page 535. You ever heard of that book? I said, you ever heard of that book? Yeah. Okay, good. About half of you. The other half of you need to read it. Desire of Ages, page 535. When the Lord is about to do a work, Satan moves upon someone to object. <laughs> Did you hear that? When God is about ready to work, the devil has his bell ringer. Ding, 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 ding. Won't work, can't work, done that, tried it, won't work. We're going to start a youth movement. And... Uh, we have an idea that we don't have to have pizza parties, puppets, and clowns, and the youth will come. And, and we're going to advertise, and we think we might get 50 people. The first GYC there ever was, there was 400 people. Can you say amen? amen. More than double what they expected. And of course, there was a whole bunch of bell rings saying, ding, 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 ding. Can't work, won't work, been there, tried that. And yet I've been to all GYCs except two of them, and I had spies at the other ones, and they told me how everything went. No pizza parties, no clowns, no puppets, no rock and roll band. Someone say amen. amen. And yet as far as the eye can see, I see young people. So when Satan is about, or pardon me, when God is about ready to do a mighty work, Satan raises up somebody to object. And get this, it doesn't have to be a bad person that objects. Who objects here? One of his disciples objects. Martha objects. You say, you know, we want to try something. We want to try something radical. We want to try something new. We want to try something innovative right here in our church. And you got a hundred people telling you how it won't work. Someone say that's true. Is that true?
won't work. When God is about ready to work, listen to the rest of this, Desire of Ages 5.35. When the Lord is about ready to work, Satan moves upon someone to object. Take away the stone, Christ said. As far as possible, prepare the way for my work. But Martha's positive and ambitious nature asserted itself. She was unwilling that the decomposing body should be brought to view. The human heart is slow to understand Christ's words, and Martha's faith had not grasped the true meaning of Christ's promise. Jesus says, okay, take the stone away. Let's get this game on. Get that stone out of there. Lazarus is going to be too weakened and emaciated to, to move that stone by himself. Move the stone. Uh oh, Jesus, you can't work right now because there's reasons you can't work right now. He's decomposing and he'll stink. Can you imagine Jesus saying, You know, you're right, Martha. I don't know why I hadn't thought of that before. Here I am, the infinite, omnipresent, omnibenevolent, omniscient God of the universe, and it hadn't dawned on me that he's going to stink. I'm sorry, leave the stone there. I'll have to wait to some future date to do a mighty work. And we chuckle, but beloved, I hope that chuckling is piercing your heart because you're a bunch of Marthas in here and you know it. You believe in Gideon's God who did something great. And you believe in the woman at the well's God who will do something great. And you're just like Martha. Oh, if you'd been here yesterday, Jesus, you could have done something mighty. And oh, Jesus, I know, after the latter rain, after the Sunday law, after the church is unified, after, 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 then you're going to work mightily. But what about today? What about right here, right now, in your life? You serve the great I was. You serve the great I will be. But what about the great I am, the only God of the Bible? Now, what do you expect? Probably the same thing that Martha did. Basically nothing. I'll tell you what you expect to do. You're just like me. You expect to wait. Did you hear what I said? You didn't like that, did you? I me mean, neither. You expect to wait. Your preacher tells you that Jesus is coming soon, but you're not so sure about it. And you might think that it is possible that he is going to come soon, but probably in your mind that's like 20 years away. After you get married and have kids. We know God is going to work in the future, don't we? And maybe that's our problem. We're busy waiting. My dad's in the military, just like Jason's dad. Jason's, your dad's in the military, right, Jason? He was, though, right? Okay, I thought so. Yeah, my dad was in the military, and, and he'd tell me that, you know, they'd have these long lines. And uh, they had this little standing joke in the military. It was, hurry up and wait. Hurry up and wait. That's what many of us are doing. Hurry up. Come to the GYC so you can wait for God to do something great at some nondescript time in the future. What do you expect? God is the great I am. I search my Bible from Genesis to Revelation and I don't find one place where God refers to himself as the great I was. Now, of course, the theologian is going to, to protest, the philosopher is going to protest that God transcends time and He's outside of time and so He is the great I was and the great I will be and the great I am. It even alludes to that in Revelation. I am Him that was and who is to come and who will always be. Of course, we're not saying that. We're, we're not arguing with the, the, the transcendence of God in relationship to time. What we are saying is that most of us are very comfortable with a God who has worked, a God who will work, but not with a God who's working. I think God's tired of it. I think God's tired of it. Amen. Open your Bible to the book of Jeremiah. 23. Jeremiah chapter 23. I hear a few amens. That means there are some Bible students out there. Jeremiah chapter 23. I'm in verse 5. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. 
In his days Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is the name by which he shall be called. Let's all say this together. The Lord our righteousness. That is to say, Jehovah our righteousness. Verse 7, now look at this. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that they shall no longer say, as the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of Egypt, verse 8, but as the Lord lives who brought up and led the descendants of the house of Israel from the what, everyone? The north country and from all the countries where I have driven them, and they will dwell in their own land. Now let's unpack that. God says, I'm going to raise up a mighty king. I'm going to raise up a mighty deliverer, the Lord, our righteousness, Jehovah, Yahweh, the Savior. And, and He's going to reign with power and confidence and it's going to be awesome. And then He says there in verses 7 and 8, And people will stop saying, God lives who brought us up out of Egypt. And they're going to start saying, God lives who brought us up out of Babylon. This is post-exilic Jeremiah. That, that is to say that, that Jeremiah is talking about the time when, when the, the, the tribes have been scattered into the north country. That's Babylon. And of course, they're also taken by Assyria as well. And so here's this, this idea that God is saying, Stop saying I'm the God who worked in the past. I know I led Moses and those others out of the land of Egypt. I know I parted the Red Sea. I know I gave them manna. I know I appeared to them on Mount Sinai. But that was thousands of years ago. I want you to start saying that God lives who can deliver today. God can deliver today. And I think that we could just as easily read into that passage, if you'll allow me just a little homiletical liberty here. I think we could say the time is far spent when we should be saying as the Lord lives who brought the children of Israel out of the north country. I think it's time that we say as the Lord lives who's alive today. God who can work right here, right now. Not just a God of the past, not just a God of the future, but a God of the present. Beloved, you need the I am in your life. Someone say amen. amen. You need the I am in your life. And yet many of us, we just have a casual brush whoop, with a dusty old God and a dusty old book whoop, who did something. And let's see if we can learn some little moral lesson so that we can take with us into our secular materialistic culture and try and be good people. The world is filled with good people. What God is looking for are radical, bold disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. God is not just looking for you to have a casual brush with an antiquated, dusty old God and then go out and be nice to your co-workers. God, and you should be nice to your co-workers. But God wants you to win your co-workers. He wants you to preach to your co-workers, to teach your co-workers, to witness to your co-workers. Always in a persuasive way, always in a happy way, always in a deferential way. But be bold for the Lord Jesus Christ. And part of the reason we're not doing it is that we don't think God is actually going to work today. In the future, oh, when God pours out His latter rain power upon me, then I'm going to be a mighty super saint for the Lord. And I will tear off my suit and underneath will be revealed the great superman. No! Today, many of us are satisfied with a God who worked yesterday and a God who will work tomorrow, but you need the great I Am. Now, what do you expect? Really? Come on, level with me. What do you expect? Nothing. Most of us, nothing. We're like Martha. Oh, Jesus, should have been here yesterday. Oh, Jesus, in the future. What about today? You know, we sing, in His time. 
God will make all things beautiful in His time. Oh, that's going to be something. Clear off on the distant horizon. When God makes all things beautiful, when God finally starts to work. Beloved, the onslaughts of materialism and secularism are eating away the very heart of primitive spirituality and it's killing us in the church. It's killing us. We have bought into the presuppositions of secularism. We have bought into the presuppositions of materialism. We do not expect God to work, but I expect God to work. Do you tonight? If you need the great I am, I want to invite you to get out of your seat and come up here and say, I need a new God. I need the God of the Bible, not some dusty old God. 